Hi, I'm Chip Hardwick. I'm the interim executive of the Synod of the Covenant, and I want to welcome you to this conversation with Scott and Elmarie Parker, who are uh, mission coworkers for the PCUSA. Uh, we're really glad to be hosting this conversation. This is the first time that the Synod, um, since I've been here, has tried something like this, and we're delighted to um, have some people here in person, and I know others will be watching later. So um, let me open us in prayer, and then I'll introduce Scott and Omari. Gracious God, you are doing work all over the world, and we're grateful that you call us to join in it. We thank you especially for Scott and Elmarie Marie and the special place that they have in your kingdom throughout the world. God, the special way you use them in ways you don't use us who are um, um, here uh, all the time permanently in the States. So thank you for their ministry. Thank you for the chance to learn from them. Thank you for the ways that you have sustained them and encouraged them. And we lift up this time together to you now. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So I want to tell you just a little bit about um, Scott and El Marie and their positions now. So, um, and I should have, I should have reading glasses, but I don't have them. So I'm going to, I need to, my, I went to the eye doctor and he said, it's finally time. So, um, but I haven't bought them yet. So let's see if I can read this without any reading glasses. Um, so um, El Marie is the PCUSA regional liaison to Iraq and Syria and Lebanon. And um, she's going to, she um, will tell some stories about the ministry there and she will um, share the vision of current PCUSA partners to addressing the challenges of the region with hope. And um, Scott Parker, um, Reverend Elmarie Parker and Reverend Scott Parker is an associate for ecumenical partnerships is gonna talk about trauma resilience skills. He and partners from the Middle East Council of Churches are cultivating with children from Iraq and Syria. So um, we're really glad, I, we, Elmarie and Scott and I were talking. We think that we met in Egypt in 2014. And so I've counted them as um, friends and people that I've admired, and people who've inspired me for a long time. And I'm really glad to be able to introduce you to Scott and Elmarie Parker. So welcome. Thank you. We'll give you so let's give them some happy hands. Hey. Everybody join in the happy hands. All right. Well, it's a gift to, to join you all. And we've been so grateful uh, for the ways in which uh, we've been sent out by Eastminster Presbytery, our, our home presbytery, and uh, the collaborations that we've had with Synod of the covenant in different ways over these nearly nine years. Can you believe it that we have been serving uh, in this role? It's uh, hard to believe that that many years have gone by. Um, and so Chip, thank you for being willing to uh, be experimental and try out this uh, Zoom way of gathering. Our, our other ways of connecting with Synod of the Covenant when we've been in person in in the area has been to come to one of the synod meetings that coincided with when we were in the in the area. So we're grateful for this opportunity. And uh, I'm going to share screen as we tell some of the story. We want to share some pictures along the way. And I'm going to reduce us to a small box so that you can see more of the screen. And you may wanna mute yourselves. Uh, that might help with a little bit of the sound feedback that we're getting. Um, as Scott and I were preparing for sharing during this time of connecting with, with churches and presbyteries and synods, uh, we were really taking some time to pray. What's the theme that the Lord is drawing us towards at a time where there's been so much, uh, especially in Lebanon, uh, chaos and change in the last two and a half years. And what we've realized is that in the midst of all of what's been going on, 
we've had an extraordinary opportunity to see the treasure of how God is at work in and through the, the very ordinary lives of our partners, our neighbors, our friends, uh, really pouring out the gift of God's life uh, into their uh, circles of influence, into the lives of those uh, that they're called to serve. And so we want to share today a combination of uh, the circumstances, especially in Lebanon, because that has changed so radically in the last two and a half years, the country is a very different country than the one we've been living in uh, the six and a half years prior. Uh, and then how our partners are at work in that context, including the trauma resiliency work that Scott will be going into more detail on. And so as we think about this idea of treasure in the ordinary, uh, there's several points of connection for us. The first is Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, where he talks about how we have this treasure of, of God's life in Jesus Christ in us as clay jars. And that contrast of the, the tremendous uh, multiple effects of thriving divine life that God chooses to have that be lived out in our ordinary lives, I think is such an amazing gift. Um, and then of course, as a denomination, we are investing in uh, being a community that is really living out of, especially that last parable in Matthew 25, uh, where we are asking the Lord to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a will to really be alongside of those who are most vulnerable, most marginalized, uh, most invisible in our various communities and to be learning from them and doing ministry with them. And we have certainly seen that reality at work in, in Lebanon as well among our partners there. And then the third point of connection is this piece of art that you see on your screen, this broken glass with the gold edges. And this is something that was done by a local Lebanese artist, Stephanie Sade. And she says about this, that every living thing has two natures, uh, that which you can easily see on the outside. And then that which you see only when something becomes broken and where you gain insight into the deep value. Uh, and that gold leaf represents the deep value uh, in this broken glass. And this also is, is part of what we have seen as we've been walking alongside, living alongside, working alongside of our partners in a situation where so much life has, has been broken in Lebanon and yet there's this extraordinary value um, in people that we are seeing come forward. So that's a little bit of the frame around what we're sharing today. Mm -hmm. We're going to be sharing this story of what's happened in Lebanon uh, through some of the street art that we've seen. And it's very different street art that has been showing up in the last couple of years. And this is one of, one of them, uh, the street art that says we are all beggars. And it really captures the deep lament of everyone who's living in Lebanon, certainly Lebanese themselves, but Lebanon is host to people from many other countries, including Syria and Iraq, uh, Palestine as well, uh, and also people working in Lebanon from all parts of Africa and Asia. Uh, and then there's a smattering of Westerners there as well from both Europe, uh, the US, Canada, Australia, uh, and so on. Uh, for all of us, we've been living in the reality of a country that has collapsed around us, and it has left people adrift without the resources that they've been able to normally count on. Uh, one of the phrases that we hear often from our partners and friends is that even at the worst of the 15 year civil war in Lebanon, things were never as bad as they are now. Uh, where now people do not have access to their bank accounts. All of that has been frozen and they, they are um, left out of, out of their savings that they've accumulated for years. Um, 
that's terribly unnerving for a variety of, of reasons. Uh, incredible inflation, anywhere between 250 and 500 percent, depending on uh, the sector of the economy that you're talking about. Um, so those are the kinds of things people have been living with. And so very much it's a situation where the middle class has become impoverished and those that were already impoverished, already economically vulnerable, have become utterly destitute. Uh, and so it's a very serious combination of things uh, that have gone on. Uh, Scott had the opportunity to talk with this gentleman that you see in the photo and he's gonna share a little bit of that conversation. Yeah, this is, this is a street that El Marie and I have walked countless times over the past nine, nine, 10 years. And um, this is a site we would have never had seen up to a year ago. Um, a, a Lebanese man with a shoe shine kit busking for, for change. Um, the, this area, this is in the Hamra part of um, Beirut, um, kind of a neighborhood, downtown kind of section. And um, th this area is known for the, sh the Syrian shoeshine boys, um, boys usually, you know, around, you know, seven to 12 years old, um, usually from Syria. Um, who, who will shine shoes for change. And, um, and the, the, these are the people that would shine shoes. You would never see a, a grown man do that. And you would never see a Lebanese do that. This was for Syrian boys. And, and so just in meeting this man, um, for me, there are just a lot of things in powerful emotions in that encounter. One, just the, the desperation. Um, uh, of this man right now, um, unemployment is at 75%. Um, so there's real desperation just to put food on the table and just the humiliation of being in this place because Lebanese are incredibly hardworking. And this is a, a position of having to be just a step up from begging um, that no, no self-respecting person wants to be in that position. And at the same time, um, I experienced dignity. Um, as we talked, there was just this understanding with him that he's gonna do what he has to do for his family. And, and that's, that's very Lebanese and Middle Eastern, that they will do whatever they have to do to, to keep going. And that's where people are at right now. This is another piece of street art that we're seeing in a number of places around the greater Beirut area. And we of course know this as one of the petitions of the Lord's Prayer, give us today our daily bread. Um, we pray it as part of our worship services. It's often a part of our devotional lives. And yet for people in Lebanon, it has truly become a plea. Uh, so there's been four tsunami type events that have enveloped Lebanon over the last two and a half years. The first is an economic collapse that really started in the spring of 2019 and became full fledged by October of 2019. Uh, that combined then with the collapse of the banking system. Uh, both of those have been catastrophic for the country. Uh, the fourth piece has been the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and of course, that's a reality for every country around the world with all of its domino effects. Uh, Lebanon has been impacted by that as well. And then the fourth piece has been the Beirut port explosion from August of 2020. And uh, that leaves a gaping wound in the city uh, it destroyed nearly a third of the city and left over 300,000 people without housing. And most of that housing has not yet been restored. Um, so in the middle of this economic crisis and banking crisis, uh, people were literally uh, blown out of their homes. Uh, and there's lots of consequences still from that. So a couple of, of tangible ways of what this means. One of our neighbors, uh, a dear friend of ours, she is a teacher at 
uh, one of the local private schools. And her salary paid in Lebanese lira is around 1,500,000 Lebanese lira. Two and a half years ago, that came out to around 1,000 US dollars a month. This is a very typical middle income type of salary in Lebanon. Today, because of the inflation rate and the devaluation of the lira, her same salary is now worth between 50 and $65 a month, depending on what's happening with the lira. And yet all of her expenses have gone up in an astronomical way. Uh, and if you're only paid in lira, then that inflation has a very real impact on your ability to live. One example of that, we all use propane for our cooking. That's what fuels our stovetops and ovens. And so when that propane bottle is empty, you take it down to the local market and you buy a replacement bottle. That replacement bottle for years cost 17,500 lira. Starting this past summer, that same bottle of propane now runs over 400,000 lira. So here's our neighbor and nearly a third of her salary has to go to just that one item for the whole month. And she still has to pay rent, still has to pay for electricity, generator, food, uh, clothing, her children's tuition and health care, all of it. And all of those prices have gone up and up and up. Um, it, it's been horrific. And she's friends. one of the fortunate 25% that still have some employment. Yeah. So you can imagine what this has meant for people who were already destitute. And that of course includes uh, many of the families who have sought refuge in Lebanon from both Iraq and from Syria and the longtime refugee population of Palestinians in Lebanon. Uh, so they are crushed under an even heavier burden at this point in time. So that's a little bit of the bigger picture of what's gone on in Lebanon. I, we wanted to share with you also a little bit about one of the very significant things that happened in this context. And that was the revolution that uh, really was very active between October of 2019 and uh, up through January of 2020 before the pandemic shut down public gatherings. Uh, you see here on the screen a, a fist. This is the symbol of the mm -hmm. revolution and in Arabic is written the word thawra. Thawra means revolution. And what was unusual about this period of protests by grassroots Lebanese and everyone else who lives in Lebanon is that it included everybody. Yeah. For the first time in Lebanon's history, there was this common coming together of everyday people to say to their government, enough with the corruption, enough with the lack of transparency, enough with the greed and, and you all benefiting financially at our expense. Uh, we want a new government put into place. Now, Lebanon works with a parliamentary system. And so what they meant by that is that they were calling for early elections in order to have new parliamentary people uh, that would therefore appoint a new prime minister and a new cabinet uh, and a new president. So uh, that was really the heart of what was going on at that time. And I think expressed the collective hope of the people in Lebanon for a different kind of future for their country. Uh, you see here also this image of the phoenix uh, made out of steel rebar. And, and the phoenix has been a potent symbol in the mythology of Lebanon for over 6,000 years. It goes back to the Phoenician uh, people that were early dwellers in that area. And that symbol of new life coming out of the ashes is what we continue to hear people in Lebanon uh, reflect on, even in the midst of some of the deep despair that they feel right now and depression. And so you have both of those realities living alongside of one another. Yeah, and I think um, 
I think for us experiencing this, you know, kind of as outsiders um, experiencing this, I think we, we saw just the people of Lebanon at, at, at their greatest. Um, the, for, for, for me, um, you know, in the evenings, um, you know, each each day of, 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 of the protests and revolution, you know, I, I would go out to um, my my thing is to feed the stray cats, and I would go go out out of our apartment building to, to feed the cats, and and you know every evening I would run into our neighbors piling into the car with their children. Their, their teenage children to um to take them to the revolution. This was a family activity because the adults wanted their children to be part of what it means to be an active citizen. One of the things that took place were um, marches. Um, different groups would march and Lebanon has, you know, gosh, about what, 18, 19 different religious sects. And, and all of them have different beefs with each other and stuff, still live together, but you know, they're, they're, you know, have, have their issues like everyone does. And, and yet during, during the revolution, you saw different groups coming together to march in unity, making a statement of, you know, we're, we're not marching for my group or this group, we're marching for the people of Lebanon. And, and these marches were typically um, organized by the women mm-hmm. of both of these groups. And so that was amazing. Um, you, saw, um, you saw music, there were weddings that took place. Um, one, of, one of the signs that, that went viral was some, some um, young women held up a sign that said, we are the happiest depressed people you will ever meet. And that really goes to the, the desperation, but the life. That, that was in this revolution. In the background here, you see these uh, tents and this was another aspect of the revolution. So Scott uh, just painted this amazing picture of how so many different peoples came together. Well, one of the things that they did is they had these educational opportunities. Mm-hmm. And so there were constitutional uh, law experts who met with the everyday people Uh, to help them learn more about their own constitution and how they could utilize the mechanisms within their constitution to call for early elections and this change in political leadership. Uh, So I found that really interesting that uh, that educational component was built into uh, these protests that gathered in every city across the country, every small town, Uh, from rural communities to large urban areas. Uh, It really was uh, quite a unique time period uh, for Lebanon. This is another piece of public art that came about at the one year uh, memorial or remembrance of the Beirut port explosion. This is down at the port. So you see in the background here, the grain silos for the country that were heavily damaged, if not all but destroyed by that Beirut uh, port blast. In the foreground from the twisted remains of the warehouses, uh, one of the local artists made this human uh, type figure and in the hand of that figure is a dove. And so again, that symbolism of of hope uh, and perseverance on the part of the people um, when still a year later, there was this level of devastation. This is another piece of public art and that cry from the heart of those living in Lebanon that their political leadership would act for justice uh, for all of the people in Lebanon. And they are still waiting for that to happen. Uh, And then this piece uh, done by artisans who collected from the literal acres of shattered glass that was a result of that port explosion and gathered those shards up and made all different kinds of art pieces, including uh, these Christmas ornaments. Again, another symbol of hope. And then this mural also from downtown Beirut, um, it takes up half a city block, It's, it's huge. And for me, it really gets at that dynamic that despair and hope are living alongside of one another in the hearts of everyone who calls Lebanon 
home. And uh, it's really our partners as they work in this context, they themselves are impacted by all of this, all of their families have to deal with all of the practical realities of life that are that much harder because of this economic and banking collapse and the dearth of electricity and internet connections and all of that. And yet every morning they get up to be part of the work that God has called them to, part of their life purpose of serving alongside and working with and ministering with those who are, who are even more vulnerable than themselves. And so our partners um, on this list, most of them are based in the Beirut area. Uh, collectively, what they are prioritizing is work right now. This includes the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon and their diaconal arm, Compassion Protestant Society. And I know uh, Eastminster Presbytery in particular are partners with both of those um, partners of, of ours. Uh, but collectively, our partners are prioritizing food security because for the first time since the famines of World War I, people are going hungry in, Le in Lebanon. And not because there isn't food available, but because people have lost all of their access to their funds and they simply cannot buy food for their families. So economic um, aid in terms of food security is one of the highest priorities for our partners. Uh, helping people continue to recover from the Beirut port blast uh, in terms of rebuilding or refurbishing their homes. Uh, that is another priority of several of our partners. And they work especially in situations where the building is still structurally sound, but windows and doors and interiors need to be redone because of the impact wave from that explosion. Uh, another of the priorities are development work, economic development work. And so this is longer term work of creating business opportunities for people in Lebanon so that they can once again be earning uh, an income and become uh, able to provide for their own families. Um, so this is another very important initiative that's going on. Uh, and then another element is trauma resiliency work. We have several partners who are doing this kind of work and Scott works with one of those partners, Middle East Council of Churches. And so uh, he's gonna share a little bit in the next 10 minutes or so uh, about that work. And then we'll take time for some interaction uh, with you all. Sounds good. So yeah, as we talk about trauma, I think that is something that that in, in, we're in a unique time in, in our world where I think all of us have some experience with it, where trauma, I think one of the ways I like to define trauma is just um, when our, our capacity to, to, um, to cope is being overwhelmed. And so there's you know, a lot of you know, capital T trauma, you know, very extreme events that have happened, but also everyday stuff and where, where I think just our experience with COVID that there is you know, a lot of people are experiencing just the long, long term you know, that comes from that. And so, so trauma, I think is something that really is uniquely relevant Elmarie talked about um, the four tsunami events that, um, that Lebanon has experienced. And that's something that those of us that work with trauma that we really wanna pay attention to. And that's something that we're really looking at with Ukraine as well, you know, because you know, those, those are situations where the issues of trauma really have to be dealt with. Um, for me, my work really um, over the past several years, um, especially the past five years, have, has really been devoted to the, the subject of child trauma. And um, um, about five years ago, um, Middle East Council of Churches asked me to begin a program that we that we now call Strong Kids, Strong Emotions. It's a, it is a 12-week um, play-based trauma resiliency program for Iraqi and Syrian refugee kids living in Beirut. And one of the reasons why um, this is such an issue, some of you may be familiar with ACEs. 
ACES is a landmark study that, um, that took place in the 90s. This was between the CDC and Kaiser Permanente Hospital in California. And, and the, the, this was, there was, this was just um, a, a groundbreaking study where they were able to make a connection between um, the level of, of childhood trauma. They, they developed a, a score system for um, things like um, living with food scarcity, um, a divorce, um, um, substance abuse, you know, a whole range of things. And, and what they found is the higher eight number of ACEs adverse childhood experiences, the, the higher the number of adverse childhood experiences that, that this child had, they found a huge connection between the likelihood that going into adulthood, that person was going to have the occurrence of, of um, unemployment, troubles with, with school, um, incarceration, e even chronic health issues like diabetes and heart disease. Um, it was just mind blowing as people saw the connection between childhood trauma and, and all, all of these um, adverse experiences in adulthood. And so as a denomination, we have said that, that we are deeply committed to eradicating um, structural poverty. And so if we are serious about that, we also need to be serious about addressing childhood trauma. And that's why Strong Kids um, exists. Um, as I said, it, it's play-based. I would love to talk about this more. Um, one of the things that, that we do with this, one of my favorite things to do is um, my partner and I, Rana, she's a Lebanese child psychologist. Um, we love to take a um, take a suitcase full of craft supplies, dump it on the table, and just tell the kids um, to make whatever their imagination compels them to make. And, and early, you know, right when we started this program five years ago, we found just magic in that. That's one of the best things that we do. And, and later we learned the neuroscience behind that. And that is there's a connection um, between the capacity for anxiety and the capacity for, um, for creativity. And they, they, the way that they're designed, they're like on a toggle switch and, and only one can activate at one time. So when we are completely immersed in our anxiety, you are, are, it's very tough to think creatively. But when our kids are able to create and be fully immersed in their creativity, their anxiety shuts off. And that's where we are able to then begin to talk about some of the hard things they're experiencing and build relationship and, and just give them time to be a kid. So what we do is, um, that everything we do is immersed in neuroscience and best evidence-based practices around trauma resiliency. Um, we use the word trauma, um, which, which kind of asks the question, what happened to you? And um, the other word that we want to use when we talk about trauma is resiliency. What makes you strong? That that yes, there is trauma, but especially when we're we're dealing with with um, vulnerable families and people who are under resourced, we want to ask the question: How we how can we help them develop skills? That, that are going to help them keep going during these challenging times. So, so we, um, we have developed um, a relationship with the Trauma Resource Institute, which is um, a nonprofit um, activist organization in Claremont, California. Um, they work throughout the world with what they call the Trauma Resiliency Model, also known as the Community Resiliency Model. And this is a set of six wellness skills that, that basically, um, first of all, this is biology based because when we talk about trauma, we really want to emphasize with families that, that all of the different traumatic symptoms that they're experiencing, this is biology. It's not weakness. This is not because you're crazy. And as we teach kids how to understand what is going on when their nervous systems are activated, 
by a traumatic event or the memory of a past traumatic event, as they understand what is, what is going on in them neurologically, first of all, it takes away the shame. But also then that's the foundation to, to learn skills with which they can manage those symptoms of trauma. So we teach six different resiliency skills. Um, I would love to take time to share each of them. We don't have time today. But what you see here are six different symbols because um, we, we do like to present our skills in, in English because that is a marketplace language. That's why you will see English in a lot of this stuff because the parents want that. But we also use Arabic, but, but they really want English. That is something that, that they've insisted on. But we also use symbols because a lot of the kids that we're working with now with refugees, they're, they're at the bottom of the list in terms of having access to education while COVID is ravaging and, and, and all of the other economic problems in Lebanon. So we have to use symbols because a lot of the 12-year-old kids we're working with um, don't yet know how to read and write. But, but we teach six wellness school skills. And, and what these skills do is in a sense, it helps them reset the nervous system. And um, this is really important from a lot of perspectives. One, this is a, an effective way to thrive. Um, this model, the trauma res resiliency model is actually being used with different groups um, throughout the world right now, or especially in the US with, with war veterans. This has been very successful with um, Iraqi and, and Afghanistan US war, war vets in helping them manage their symptoms of trauma so that it's very effective and and it is putting it, it, it's an empowerment model that's that's putting um, putting the skills and managing one's trauma in in the person's own hands mm -hmm. and and sometimes you know that is enough sometimes the person is going to benefit from more in-depth um, 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 counseling and therapy, but this, this takes the edge off. This, um, this creates um, a, a sense of ownership and empowerment and dignity. And this is uh, an important starting point in, in dealing and managing with one's trauma. And I will stop there um, just with time. Um, do I have time to share any other aspects of this? You want to just talk oh, yeah. about the resilience? Zone Sounds great. I just wasn't sure how much time I had, so I wanted to be so 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 what you see here, these we call these mini-me's. And and you know, like I said earlier, of just the therapeutic um benefit of using crafts. And that's why um you, you might be part of a church that has um, donated funds or tangible craft supplies to the program. That's what we use these things for. Um, so the kids, they make these mini me's. Um, we do other craft things too, but that's one of our favorites. On the first day of the 12 week program, we always like to start with this. And we use this um, to help teach the kids how to monitor themselves in what we call the resilient zone or the okay zone. And, and that's kind of where all of us, you know, in, in, a, in a good day, you know, we're somewhere in the resilient zone. And that's just the ability to bounce back. You know, we have good things that happen in the day, not so good things, and something might upset me, but you know, I can, I can bounce back. You know, that's being in the resilient zone. It's not the happy zone. You know, you may not be happy, but you can be okay. You can bounce back in that ebb and flow of life. But sometimes um, an event or, or the memory of an event can trigger, trigger you and bump you up into what we call the high zone of being upset, agitated, um, panicked, um, you know, just that could be angry or fearful, you know, bumped up into the high zone. Um, and sometimes we can get stuck stuck there. Or sometimes we can get bumped into the low zone of that could be depression or just profound long-term sadness or numbness. But we can get bumped into the high zone or the low zone and we can get stuck there. 
And so um, we use these mini me's to go through different experiences that the kids have had, and we help them talk about what can get them bumped into the high zone, and, and then what can get them back into the okay zone. So this last, this past fall, um, we were, um, we had to go um, on hiatus for about nine months because of COVID and, um, and protests in the street, um, fuel shortages, um, nine months where we didn't have strong kids. So, so in the fall, it was really exciting to get back into strong kids again. And in one of our first weeks back, there was a, um, um, I, I remember we were doing something and out outside the window, we're right off the street, outside the window, a car backfired, all of the kids just froze. And you could just see it in them. Everything went silent. All of the muscles, you could just see the tensing up. Eyes got wide. All of the kids have been triggered that by that, that car backfiring brought them back to a year and a half prior when they experienced the Beirut port blast. It's amazing, just a smell, a sound transports you back to that time of trauma. And so then we were able to tell the kids, all right, um, we've talked about you know, this, you know, where are you right now? And they talked about they're in their high zone. <laughs> they were activated. So then we said, okay, we've talked about skills that you can use to get back into the okay zone. What do you want to do? And each kid chose a different skill. One kid went to um, a bottle of water and, and took a drink of water. That's one of the sensory or somatic skills that one can do. And there's a whole science behind this. Um, another kid um, walked around the room. That's another thing that you can do. Um, one, of, one of the kids just sat in place and looked around the room and named the different colors that she saw in the room. These, these are skills that basically tell the mind and the nervous system that everything is okay. That's resetting the nervous system. Um, another kid um, just closed, closed his eyes and, and in a sense, meditated on a very powerful, beautiful past memory. We call that resourcing. So there's a whole range of skills that we teach our kids um, and, and their families um, to, to use. So these are very practical skills and um, sensory-based interventions that they can use to manage their own symptoms of trauma. Um, I, I guess I'll just kind of close with um, one of, dur dur during this, this fall session, Rana, and, and by the way, both Rana and I have been trained in, in the trauma resiliency model, one of the real gifts um, of um, church um, church involvement is we had the funding this year to um, to put Rana through um, both level one and level two of trauma resiliency model training. And so now this is a skill that she's able to bring into her therapeutic work with our kids. So that's really key. But um, while, while we were doing our fall session, um, Rana told me that one of the kids had come up to her and said, this is the only time during the week when I feel happy. And that was a real bittersweet thing for us to hear. Because on one hand, it, it just kills us that, that kids, that being a refugee kid is hard. It is tough for many, many reasons. Um, and it just hurts that even in these very loving families, they are experiencing so much stress and trauma. And at the same time, it is sweet that we are, that we know these kids have at least two and a half hours a week where they are able to talk about their issues and to begin healing and two and a half hours where they can be a kid. And that two and a half hours stretches into three hours, four hours, a whole day where they're able to experience resiliency and health. So that's a glimpse into um, what has been happening in Lebanon, uh, the work of our partners in that context, and especially the 
a needful priority on trauma resiliency work and the ways, especially that Middle East Council of Churches uh, through the Strong Kids program and other programs uh, are working to cultivate that. Um, so we're grateful for this time with you all. Uh, we've been so thankful for uh, the ways in which people from Senate of the Covenant have partnered with us and with our partners in all different kinds of ways uh, across the years. And so we invite you to continue to, to walk and journey with us and with our partners. We're always available by email, uh, happy to interact with any uh, questions that you might have. Uh, we're also happy to meet with your uh, different mission committees or session. We can arrange to do that by Zoom um, from Lebanon. Uh, be happy to do that. We also work with two different advocacy networks, partnership networks. One is focused on Iraq and the other on Syria and Lebanon. Uh, this is a gathering of Presbyterians in the US who feel a pull to this particular part of the world and wanna be part of very deliberate work with our partners. So I uh, would highly commend you to uh, take a look at their Facebook pages, uh, the Syria Lebanon Partnership Network also has a website that has some really great resources on it. Um, so happy to connect you with those facilitators as well, if you would like to do that. Uh, and then for financial partnership in, in particular related to what we've shared here today, uh, if you'd like to be part of the relief uh, and development work that our partners are doing, um, you can see the information there for how to direct that support uh, for strong kids, strong emotions, and other uh, trauma work that the Middle East Council of Churches is doing. Um, that information is there as well. And then, uh, of course, we would not be able to do this work without the collaboration of partners like you. Uh, that allow us financially to be able to be your visible uh, representation of your interest and commitment uh, and prayers uh, to our partners in Lebanon and, and Syria and Iraq. And for that, they are very grateful. It makes a difference to them to have people on the ground with them, accompanying them uh, on behalf of the Peace USA. So thank you for your part in that. I'm gonna stop sharing screen and then uh, we're happy to have some conversation with you all. Uh, if you're looking for opportunities to interact directly with a number of our partners, we are hosting every Thursday uh, at both noon Eastern and 3 p.m. Eastern a Lenten reflection time. We have a different partner from uh, the Middle East joining us each week. And uh, that really has been a, a marvelous time of doing some scripture reflection together, hearing from our partners of what that means in their context, uh, being able to learn about their work a bit and being able to pray together. So uh, if you'd like further information on that, uh, let me know and I can get that to you. Thoughts or questions or observations, uh, feedback that you'd like to share. How are the universities doing? I'm thinking University of Beirut and Beirut Women's College, are they still operating? Yeah, Lynn, thank you for that question. Um, the, the Beirut College for Women has actually become Lebanese American University over the years. It's now co-educational. Uh, in my role as regional liaison, I have the privilege of sitting on their board and that has indeed been a, a deep privilege. Uh, they are an incredibly vibrant uh, educational institution. They now have two campuses. Uh, they have a medical school, two different training hospitals, uh, and they are among uh, the key leaders in Lebanon, especially at this time of uh, continuing to provide exceptional care uh, in a time where the medical system has just been decimated by these economic events. Uh, along with really caring for their students and staff and faculty in a way that has given people hope to keep yeah. on keeping on. Uh, this all has 
definitely impacted every educational institution um, in deep ways. Uh, it's very challenging, but I'm very impressed with LAU's president and uh, his team. They've um, just done some extraordinary work and have remained true to that early mission that emerged out of Sarah Smith's uh, call. Yeah. So very grateful for them. Uh, same with the Synod schools, they have continued, uh, but they are also under immense pressure because as you can imagine, when parents are frozen out of their bank accounts, how in the heck do you pay tuition? And everything rides on tuition. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the ways that World Mission and, and Presbyterian Disaster Assistance has been walking along with the Synod is uh, helping through grants to carry some of those expenses. Um, and hopefully there will be an end in sight to uh, this series of catastrophic events in, yeah. in Lebanon. So thank you for that question. Scott, uh, if I could ask a question. Um, with the, when you work with the kids, where are you working through the schools or Hmm. Is there a pro it seems like every kid in Lebanon should be going to the to this program. So how do you I mean, how do you possibly um, narrow that down? And I mean, I, God bless you for doing it. Um, it's I think every kid in the US should be going through it, too, actually. <laughs> but I mean, um, you know, how what's the process? I mean, for families even to find you? Well, very good question. So so this is this is a program of Middle East Council of Churches. Um, so really they provide, so basically MECC, they're, they're providing all of the infrastructure for this program and, and then um, you know, gifts from partner churches in the U.S. is really providing kind of the programming, but, 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 it's, um, but the foundation is Middle East Council of Churches. And, and we work with one of their, um, basically they have a, um, um, what I would call a, a medical social work hub called Our Lady Dispensary. It just has that name because that's the name of the church that that gives them use of these facilities. And this is um, this is kind of a hub that's kind of in a central location in Beirut. Um, it's called the Septia neighborhood, and this is kind of strategically located where there's kind of the highest concentration of of Iraqi, Syrian, Palestinian refugees, along with vulnerable Lebanese. Mm -hmm. so, so they've been there for about 30 years. They, they provide you know, medical assistance, social work, um, and, and it's really from the social work um, part that, um, that the, the social worker um, team, that they, they, they work with what, probably 3,000 families a month. Um, they give amazing care. And, and so they know these families. And so really we have them, them pick the, the students that we're gonna work with. Um, one, because like when we were starting, we really wanted you know, a, a mix um, like of, um, we have, we have um, you know, Christian kids, Muslim kids, and so making sure there's a mix. The other thing that OLD does is we really try to have kids who have at least one parent that's, that's connected in their system and is getting some type of psychosocial support so that as we are kind of teaching trauma and resiliency and wellness skills, that there's at least some reinforcement and common language with the parents. So that's really important. So, and it, yeah, I, I think it really does feel like this is just a drop in the bucket. And yet I, I feel like this is a start. Um, what we're doing, um, there has been psychosocial work that's, that's being done by OLD and many other organizations, but I do feel like what we're doing is, um, is, is really on the leading edge of, of what is out there. And I do think it is unique and important. And so Rana and I, we're really just working to begin educating people. So with our MECC folks, 
um, um, with the OLD staff. Right now, we're just very quietly and humble, not quietly, but we're, you know, just very gently telling people what's going on and, and helping them understand this because this is a model that, that I think is, um, it, it's, it's far more effective. One, because we're in, we're in a region where there's a stigma with um, mental health. And so most people are never going to go to um, a therapist. Well, that's okay because you can do a lot. You can make a big dent just with teaching these skills. And so some of the things that we've that we are wanting to do that just because of COVID and and fuel shortages, um, we had a um, we this fall we were going to do a whole Zoom teaching. Um, session. We are going to teach the resiliency skills to um, to school teachers throughout Lebanon, but then their um, but then school got canceled for the start in the fall, so so that got got postponed. Um, also, with um, um, the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon, we're in conversations with their with with CPS, so Compassion Protestant Services Society. Society. Um, um, we, we met with them last year when they just had a big change up. And so, so we need, we need to revisit that, you know, cause we're, we're wanting to, we're really wanting to spread the joy now that Rana is trained, that really kind of doubles our, um, our capacity just to begin teaching people. So that's what we're going to try to be doing. Thank you. I want to thank you, Scott and Omri, so much. We're out of time. Although I bet you two would stick around for any questions. I want to honor the time that we had said, but I, I bet you would be willing to stick around for questions any after I close this off in prayer. But um, I am so um, just so captivated thinking about the interplay of despair and hope and yeah. the, um, the descriptions of Lebanon that you shared are so devastating. And yet there's still the hope that we know in Jesus Christ. There's the now and the not yet uh, that we know of the gospel. And that um, it's um, it's hearing presentations like this that make me want to say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, um, come quickly. And thank you for being um, Christ's hands and feet there in Lebanon. Although right now you're on the West Coast, am I right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, right. So, um, so thank you for also being Christ's hands and feet there yeah. um, on the West Coast. But let me let me close this off in prayer. And then anybody that um, needs to go can go. And then um, anyone that would like to stay and chat more with Omari and Scott, I'm sure um, they'd, they'd be glad to do that. So let me close in prayer. Gracious God, we know that your heart breaks even more than ours as we think about the all the crises and all the trauma that's going on in Lebanon. Thank you for the ministries of churches and people like Scott and Elmarie. God, stretch us, teach us, help us to know um, how to care for your children there. We're grateful for this time together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>